Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Good morning and welcome to worship here at St. Luke Lutheran Church. It's a joy to have you here in worship this morning. A uh, special welcome to any guests and visitors who we have here with us at some point during the service. If you wouldn't mind grabbing one of those connect cards in the pew in front of you, uh, letting us know you're here. If you flip that over, you can leave us a prayer request on the back side. And then later on in the service, as the offering plates come by, just go ahead and drop them in the offering plate. We'd appreciate that. Uh, I hope that you have been uh, following along with us as we've been reading through the Bible. If you've gotten behind or you haven't started, uh, there's no time like the present. And just jump in where we're at. I, I looked the other day as I've been listening through the Bible that we are uh, past the 100-day mark of reading together. So uh, jump right in wherever you're at, and Pastor Todd will, will continue uh, leading us through that, uh, through the sermon messages, as well as uh, through, our, through the Bible uh, study. Uh, we're following Divine Service Setting 1 this morning. If you're using a hymnal, you can find that on page 151. I invite you to rise for our opening hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. First reading is taken from the book of John, First John, chapter three, verses sixteen to twenty-four. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions, and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? They are children. Let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the tenth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay my life, I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. This is the gospel of the Lord. Now together as God's people, we speak the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're looking at uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open 1, Corinthians, 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, this past week we have just run through so much of uh, the, the development of the nation of Israel. Uh, so last week we talked about David and Bathsheba and uh, that David's handling of uh, his affair with Bathsheba would lead to the division of the nation of Israel. And uh, we read through the, the uh, reign of Solomon, David's son, and then David's grandson, how he brought about the split of the nation. Ten tribes, the northern kingdom took the name Israel, and uh, they went their separate way. You have the two tribes that became, become the southern kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Judah, and that's why we get the term Jews to refer to people of, the, of that southern kingdom. The southern kingdom um, more or less follows the Lord. The northern kingdom mostly chooses not to follow the Lord. They set up their own religion, oddly enough, two golden calves. And, uh, and then it gets, goes downhill from there. Where we are now in chapter 19, um, Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom. Uh, and his wife, Jezebel, the queen, she really rules. I mean, Ahab is kind of a weak guy, and he just does what his wife wants him to do. And, and uh, Scripture tells us that both of them uh, uh, tested the Lord in, in greater than any other king. So they set the standard for what it means to be a, a bad king, a rebellious king from the Lord's perspective. 
And the Lord sent Elijah. So we're looking at Elijah today. And in chapter 18, you have that phenomenal uh, event that happens where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to the contest to see whose God is real. And you have this very uh, amazing demonstration of the power of God as the, the prophets of Baal are you know, begging their God to consume the fire and nothing happens at one point. Elijah kind of like pokes them a little bit and he says, well, maybe you need to cry out a little bit louder because maybe he's in in the bathroom taking a dump. And, uh, you know, that did not help uh, the prophets of Baal at all, as they probably, you know, were even more fervent in trying to call their God into account and, you know, start this fire. And then, you know, Elijah has his sacrifice floating in water and says, Lord, show these people you know, that you are God, and this fire comes down and consumes everything, even the rocks, the 12 stones. And the people of Israel seem like they turn around. It's, it, they, they put to death the prophets of Baal, and it seems like everything is going to go his way. But when uh, Jezebel hears of it, she threatens Elijah's life. And at uh, the beginning of chapter 19, you say, you, you hear her message to the prophet Elijah, Elijah. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and evermore, that is what happens with the sword, if I do not make your life as a life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So he was afraid, it says, and he rose and ran for his life. He was the Forrest Gump of the Old Testament, if you didn't catch that. He's running everywhere. Like, from where the... Uh, uh, tested of the prophets occurred to the um, uh, capital city. It's about a 20 mile run. He ran and beat the chariot there. And then he's running into the wilderness. And, you know, he's just uh, uh, running, but he was afraid. Now, I wonder why was he afraid of, the Jeze of Jezebel? After he had seen God um, demonstrate to the people how clear, you know, clearly demonstrate he is the, the God of power and might. Why would he be afraid of Jezebel? And it's not in Scripture, but I, I think his source of discouragement and fear is the fact that nothing changed. He ran back thinking things would be different. He ran back to see how this spark that happened in the wilderness would be fanned into this flame that would bring about revival and and. Uh, uh, restoration of the nation of Israel, and nothing changed. She ranted, and the people just responded. And he was afraid and discouraged because nothing changed. And he went into the wilderness, and he hid under the bush. I, this, this part of, the, of him being afraid of her, to me it reminds me of 1 Peter chapter 3, or 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Uh, he says, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And um, uh, whipping out a little bit of my Africa knowledge because now I'm all, all knowledgeable about Africa after two trips. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> so, I've been told, and I'm probably just a gullible guy from America, but uh, I've been told that the roaring lions, um, the lions that roar the most, are generally the older lions. And they are the lions who, are, who have no teeth, and they're trying to keep predators away simply by their voice. And uh, it's the si silent lions you've got to kind of worry about. And it remind, this is what I think of in Jezebel, is she has no teeth, but she's roaring. But it was enough to scare him, right? How many times are we afraid of the roar, and we forget that we have a God who is greater and that our enemy has been rendered impotent. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, he defeated sin, death, and the devil. And the devil, he's very active in our world, but he is in his death throes. The victory has been won. He has no power over you and me. His roar can be terrifying, but we have nothing to fear because our God is the victory. But Elijah, he's afraid. He's under the bush, taking a little nap. I guess you run that much, you need to take a nap. He's taking a nap, 
And the angel pokes him, wakes him up, and says, Hey, eat and drink. Does this two times. And the second time he said, Go to the Mount Horeb. Remember, Mount Horeb was the mountain that Moses encountered God for the first time. It's the mountain with the burned, burning bush. And so Elijah gets up and he takes a 40-day journey. So just to get a sense of the time, it's 40 days after, 41, 42 days after the prophet event that he goes to Mount Horeb. And God said to go to the mountain, but he went one step further. He went to a, a cave in the mountain. I think it took a little bit of time for him to search. So he was intentionally looking for somewhere to hide. He was in this cave. And I wonder what kind of cave it was for Elijah. Was this a cave of fear that he's afraid of Jezebel, so he's hiding so she can't find him? Is it a cave of anger? I don't want to deal with you, God. Look at all that I've done for you, and nothing has worked out. Is it a cave of shame? I'm af I was afraid, and I ran and hid, and I'm afraid of what God is going to do. I'm ashamed of my actions. What kind of a cave was this for Elijah? Is it a cave of comfort? Because it's interesting, it says that he entered into this cave. Um, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. <clears throat> he came into the cave, verse 9, and lodged in it. Lodged in it. That's a, an interesting term. It, it literally means he made a, a house in it. He, he set up his home. Like, this is it. I'm, I've gone to Mount Horeb, and this is as far as I go. And he's you know, made a little bed there, maybe got a little fireplace, going to go to Ikea and get some stuff to put in there. This is his home from now on. This is where he's going to live. It's his place of shelter. But God asked him a very powerful question. Why are you here? Why? What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 9. And the Lord's going to answer say that question twice so it's important that we take note of it this is an important question he's asking now he could be asking you know why are you here at Mount Horeb but of course Elijah could say well you told me to come to the mountain he could be asking why are you here in this cave what are you trying to accomplish in this cave I see you're setting up house it could be asking Elijah why are you here in this world what's your purpose we're not really given a clear answer, but, uh, but the Lord will redirect Elijah's sense of purpose in response the second time he asked him. So in response, Elijah, he says, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, Am left, and they seek my life to take it away. I think there's a little bit of anger in that response. Look at all I've done for you. And what has it accomplished? Nothing. And even I am under the threat of death. And that Jezebel continues to live, Ahab continues to reign, and things continue to go on and on. I think that this is a, 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 a Elijah is. Stating his case very clearly, I've done enough and I'm not going to do anything else. No more, is his response. So the Lord, the Lord tries to remind Elijah who he is. And he says, come out of the cave and I will show you, I will show myself to you. And so we have that well-known event that took, takes place where the wind, like a tornadic wind, because it's like tearing up rocks and trees and stuff, it goes in front of the cave and God is not in the wind. And then you have this mighty earthquake, and it must have been really terrifying to be in the cave, this mighty earthquake, and the rocks are falling, and the land is splitting open, and God is not in the earthquake. And then this consuming fire, this raging, roaring fire goes in front of the cave, and God is not in the fire. And then notice verse 12. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. In verse 13, and when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. So did you do notice the Lord had said to him, come out and I'm going to show you 
I'm going to show myself to you. Come out. But he didn't come out. He didn't come out of the cave, right, and tell the whisper. He didn't come out of the cave and, and tell God coaxed him with this gentle whisper. Because God is a God of power and might, but God is a God of love and compassion, and God calls him out in this gentle voice. And he came out, and his face was wrapped because you can't see God and live. So that's why his face is wrapped here. It reminds me of Zechariah 4, 6, Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. And in this whispery voice, God says, Why are you here? The same question. And Elijah gives the same answer. He's not giving ground. Look at all that I have done for you. And nothing has changed. And the reason I want to focus on this section here for us is because I think many of us, if not all of us, have our Elijah cave moments in life where we feel like we have done all that we can do and we can't do any more, or we are overwhelmed by the fact that everything we have done accomplishes nothing. What have I accomplished with my life? I think it's very easy for us to get discouraged. For those of us who, who are a little bit older, we can remember 15, 20 years ago when there would be a line of cars going out of our, our subdivisions to get to church on Sunday morning. And when our parking lots were full, and when you could leave your bicycles in the front lawn and nobody would steal them because people had a general sense of Christian moral ethics, and it pervaded the land, and it was a different time, <coughs> and it was a wonderful time. And then we look around us today and we say, but what has it accomplished? And there are some of us who have children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren that are, are not in church on a Sunday morning and, and don't seem to follow the things of God, and we wonder, what has it accomplished? I was faithful. I went to church. I took the kids to Sunday school. I, I did this and I did that. And God, look, what has it accomplished? So we're in this cave, this cave of anger and fear and regret, and we just want to stay in the cave. Pretend like it doesn't really exist. And God calls us out. Because we have call, been called for a purpose. So it's a very important question that God is asking you today. Why are you here? What is God doing in your life today? What is your purpose? Now we can all acknowledge the fact that we collectively have this purpose. To seek and save that which is lost. In John chapter 20, Jesus said, As the Father sent me, I am sending you. We've all been sent to share the good news and the gospel message. That's our general purpose as God's children. But what's your purpose, your unique purpose? The Lord tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and Romans chapter 12 that we have been gifted for a unique purpose in God's kingdom. And what is your purpose? We can get so busy and so caught up in trying to do things for God that we forget He has a purpose for us. And maybe we lose sight of the purpose because we're so focused on the goal. That's what happened with Elijah. And God wanted to remind him. Wanted to remind him that there's a plan, a greater plan, a plan which he did not know of. So he sends him out to anoint kings and to call Elisha, who would be an even greater prophet. And he reminds him, he, he leaves him with this reminder, 7,000 are still, still live in this country that have not bent the knee to Baal. That's to be in a word of encouragement to say there are people you don't know about. But it's also a word of reminder, you have been called for those 7,000. You have been called to be the wall for the 7,000, the wall of protection. And I want to encourage you to, to let you know there are many, many people who still believe. And the church is still growing around the world and in parts of our country. It's also growing rapidly. And right now we might be in a, a bit of a step back and a bit of a, a, a pause 
position that makes us wonder, what's this all about? But God has a plan, and you have a calling. And I pray that you find joy and peace in that. For Elijah found strength in God's words to get up and to go and continue a productive ministry. Please join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, when we are in a cave of despair and fear, that you would be as patient with us as you were with Elijah. That as Elijah stood and, and uh, vented his frustration, you didn't correct him or rebuke him. You allowed him to, to speak what was in his heart. And you acknowledged what was in his heart, Father, and reminded him of the greater purpose that, we, that he has. And I pray you would remind us of the greater purpose that we have. That we can find strength and confidence even in times of scarcity, in times of, of uh, uh, difficulty. Our desire, Father, is to be of service to you and to advance your kingdom of grace. Bless us to that end in Jesus' name. Amen. What a joy it is to gather together in this place of worship and to worship our good and gracious Lord. And as part of our worship, we give our tithes and offerings each week. Now this morning, if you'll be leaving an offering, you can drop it in the offering plates as they come by. So I encourage you to put those connect cards in the offering plates. You can give electronically as you see on the screen. Uh, thank you to those of you who give faithfully online. Receive the offering at this time.
the shepherd of Israel, in your son Jesus Christ, you have sought out your sheep and gathered us into your flock. Keep us always in your fold and guard us from every wolf and snare. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you alone gather us as your sheep and send faithful shepherds to us. Call all who have wandered from your flock and bless the faithful shepherds who gather them through the voice of your word. We lift up our call process here at St. Luke, asking that you would continue to guide and direct our next steps. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son has called us to love our brothers and sisters. Turn us in love toward the neighbors closest to us, especially within our own homes, that we may daily show our confidence in God by deed and truth, laying down our lives as Christ first did for us. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, through your Son, Jesus, you secured forgiveness for our troubled consciences. Be with those who suffer among us, especially Matt, Liam, Janet and John. Grant them aid in this moment, and even more so, true immortal health in the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our shepherd, you calm all fears in this valley of the shadow of death, and you prepare the holy table of your son's testament for us in the presence of our enemies. Grant us repentant and faithful hearts, in every trial and tribulation, lead us to find comfort and strength in your un overflowing mercy given to us here in this sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord God, out of your fatherly goodness, you have remembered us poor, miserable sinners and given your beloved Son to be our shepherd, not only to nourish us by his word, but also to defend us from sin, death, and the devil. Grant us your Holy Spirit that even as this shepherd knows us and helps in every affliction, we also may know him and trust him, seek help and comfort in him, heartily obey his voice, and obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he destroyed death. By his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of mankind, heaven and earth are full of your glory.
our Lord Jesus Christ in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy.
Please rise. May this, the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in true faith and to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. Amen. thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated for a moment as we have a call committee update. Just have a brief uh, update from the call committee. Um, we received our list from the district, um, and after discussion and prayer, we have four names that we are considering for our next senior pastor. Um, we have begun to have interviews, and once those are finished in the next week or so, um, we will meet again to discuss our next steps. Um, we ask that uh, you continue to keep us the call committee and your prayers, also the pastors and the church as a whole. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or any of the other members of the call committee. Thank you. Thank you, O'Neill. But you'd rise for the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.